Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Family Heart Foundation FH Community Forum. Um, we welcome you all jo to join us for this uh, topic, which is living with high LDL cholesterol, getting to the safe zone. And we're thrilled to have Dr. Mary McGowan, Chief Medical Officer of the Family Heart Foundation, as our host and um, our wonderful panelists, Jessica, Kevin, Mackenzie, and Megan. My name is Kat Davis Ahmed, and I am with the Family Heart Foundation. And each year we hold a community forum for FH and another for High LP Little A, which is uh, a two days uh, on the which we'll be holding in in, in two days, um, where we talk about an important important topic, and we hear from people who are living with. Um, with FH in this case, and with homozygous FH in their family. So I'm just absolutely thrilled to have you all here and to have our great panelists. So if we move on to um, the next couple of slides, I'll give you some housekeeping. Um, and nothing that you learn here it should all be for your education, but not uh, not considered medical advice. If you need um, to find a specialist and you have medical questions, the Family Heart Foundation Care Navigation Center can help you. Um, but this, uh, this session itself is not medical advice. If we would love it, if you would all say hello and introduce yourselves in the chat, maybe you say your name and where you're from and, and leave a comment if you like. It's nice to get to know each other uh, as we all gather here virtually. So please put your notes in the chat. And throughout the session, you're welcome to put questions in the Q&A, which you can find down there at the bottom of your screen. So if you put your questions in, we'll get to questions in the discussion after our panel um, discussion. And um, we'd like to thank the sponsors of our 2022 FH Community in Action and HOFH Community in Action programs, Amgen and Kanika, who supported the FH Community in Action program, Regeneron and Amrit, who supported the homozygous FH Community program, and our family heart partners, families who, um, who really put, put a lot into, into everything that we do and support our work. Thank you all. So with that, I am just absolutely thrilled to introduce Dr. Mary McGowan, who is the Chief Medical Officer at the Family Heart Foundation, and she will give a short presentation and then um, and lead our, our great discussion with our panelists. Dr. Thanks. McGowan. Thanks very much, Kat. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to welcome everybody today. Um, today, we're going to be discussing um, how people can get to their LDL safe level even if they're living with heterozygous or homozygous FH. And I would like to say that I think we're very lucky to be living in a time where each year that goes by, we have new options um, for cholesterol lowering. And we're particularly um, thrilled that we've recently had new options for homozygous FH. Today, we are going to hear from people living with familial hypercholesterolemia, Mackenzie Ames, Megan Pearson, Jessica Fikes, and Kevin Tuxen. Um, they're all living with heterozygous FH. Kevin and Jessica actually learned that they had FH after giving birth to a daughter who has homozygous FH. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna introduce those panelists or they'll introduce themselves in a few minutes. But I thought that what we do first is talk a little bit about familial hypercholesterolemia. Now, I realize that many people on the line tonight or on the webinar um, know a lot about familial hypercholesterolemia because you're living with it. Uh, but I think there may be some people who are new to this. So we're just going to have a few slides about what FH is, and then we'll really get into our discussion with our panelists. Next slide. So we're going to talk about FH and why we worry about it. Um, we'll have our introductions and we'll talk about barriers uh, to getting to the LDL safe level. Sometimes the barriers could be um, related to uh, your healthcare provider not wanting to add um, a particular medication or not understanding um, what your goal is. Um, next slide. So what is FH and how is FH inherited? Next slide. So when we think about FH, we think about the F, the H, and it equals FH. So a family history of early cardiovascular disease should trigger um, somebody to think about uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. 
having a high LDL cholesterol. And in an adult, we consider that LDL greater than or, or equal to 190 and in children greater than or equal to um, 160. And so that combination of a family history and um, very elevated LDL cholesterol should make you think of familial hypercholesterolemia. Next slide. Um, FH is what we call an autosomal codominant genetic disorder, and that's a lot of words. Um, but essentially, what it means is that FH, if you inherit even a single gene for FH, you're going to manifest familial hypercholesterolemia. If you inherit two genes um, for familial hypercholesterolemia, you're going to have an even higher LDL. So if you are a parent who has FH or a person that has FH, each time you have a child, there's a 50% chance you're going to pass on the gene um, for FH to your children. Next slide. And so then the next question you might ask is how common is FH? And the next slide. FH is very common. As many as um, one in 250 people um, have FH and most do not know they have FH, which is a, a problem because it's only when you know you have FH that you can seek care. And we say one in 250 people, and there've been some recent prevalence um, studies done, two very good studies done in 2020. And um, they suggest that people who have already gotten, already developed cardiovascular disease, it's even, even more common, like about one in 30 um, people that have cardiac disease um, have FH. And people who have early cardiovascular disease, say, um, meaning less than 65 for women, less than 55 for men, um, it's about one in 15. So um, early heart disease should really trigger physicians, um, healthcare providers to think about FH, but sadly it often does not. Next slide. And then the question, I've already alluded to this, that there can be more than one type of FH. Next slide. And as you see here, HEFH, which stands for heterozygous FH, you've only inherited one gene for familial hypercholesterolemia. And the LDL, as I've mentioned, very high, greater than 160 for children, greater than 190 for adults. Um, we start seeing the onset of cardiovascular disease. Now it depends, but somewhere between 30 and 60 years of, uh, of age. And most respond well to drug therapy. And as I said, it's quite common, one in 250 people. Homozygous FH is, is more rare um, because it means that two um, individuals with heterozygous FH um, have to have a child. Um, and if they have a child, 25% um, of their kids will have homozygous FH, 50% heterozygous FH, and 25% um, of the time the child will be born without FH. But homozygous FH two genes, you've inherited um, two genes for FH. And we know that LDL cholesterol can be very elevated, um, over 400. Um, in some cases, it can be a little less than 400. And in other cases, it can be as high as 1,000. So very, very elevated. Untreated, um, we can see cardiovascular onset in childhood. And I stress untreated. And I also say that this poor response to drug therapy, this is really changing. And that should be cause for smiles on everybody's face. Um, we have, we're living in a time where we have new agents that are specifically for um, homozygous FH. So we have um, lipoprotein apheresis, but we also have two drugs, one called lomidopide and one called uh, evenuncumab. And um, these agents um, can um, really lower LDL quite profoundly in individuals with, um, with homozygous FH. And homozygous FH is rare, about one in 300,000 individuals. Next slide. So what are the risks associated with FH? And I think I've already alluded to this as well. Next slide. So FH leads to very high LDL cholesterol from birth and it can lead to um, premature cardiovascular disease. And so what I'd like to point out here is if you see the, the line, the sort of orange line that says without FH, and this is looking at when people cross the threshold for having some atherosclerosis in their arteries. So 
people in the general population cross that threshold around 55. Um, now, that doesn't mean everybody has a heart attack at 55, certainly not. And it can be even earlier if they are smokers, have high blood pressure, diabetes, um, but that's um, without FH. If you look at the red line, this is heterozygous FH. Heterozygous FH, one gene um, for FH. Left untreated, people with heterozygous FH cross that threshold for developing cardiac disease, um, coronary heart disease, CHD, um, 20 years earlier. And you can see though, um, with the purple line, if you start low dose statins, as you should, um, at around the age of um, nine to 11, um, then you can see that these children um, who become adults, they, they're, the time that they cross the threshold is almost the same as um, somebody who um, does not have FH. If we wait till somebody's in their 20s um, to initiate even high dose statins, um, that curve, you can see the, the teal blue curve, it's at 48 years. So certainly better um, than 35, but not quite as good. So the earlier we start um, children with FH on medications, the better. I would say um, now that we have even more powerful agents, um, these curves may, may change a little bit more. And then homozygous FH, we can see disease in childhood, but it's a, it's a time of great encouragement for homozygous FH because um, rather this would be the non-treated state that you cross the line at about 12 and a half. Um, but um, we see um, these new agents that are giving us great hope um, for kids with homozygous FH, adults with homozygous FH to have a very long life. Next slide. Um, FH can be life-threatening. We know that one in five heart attacks under the age of 50 is caused by FH. And if left untreated, a study from Holland found that 25% of individuals um, with FH will have experienced um, a cardiac event. That means like a heart attack or needing a stent by the age of 40. Next slide. Um, this slide um, looks at data from our own registry in the teal. Um, these are um, pr the percentage of individuals with cardiovascular disease in these age ranges, less than 18, 18 to 30, 31 to 45, 46 to 65, and over 65. And you can see in our registry, many people are not diagnosed until adulthood. Um, and so there's significant uh, underlying coronary artery disease as compared to what you see from the behavioral risk factor surveillance um, system, which is from the CDC. This is the general population. And that um, what we see is you really don't start seeing any appreciable um, cardiovascular disease until the 31 to 45 range. And it, what you're looking at is in the, um, I guess it's called magenta or reddish. Um, you can see that um, people with familial hypercholesterolemia, if left, um, if not treated aggressively, um, will get into trouble very early with cardiac disease. Next slide. So a lot of people um, have seen their physician. Um, their physician may put them on a medication to lower their cholesterol, but a lot of people that we've talked to, um, people both with familial hypercholesterolemia and without, don't know what their goal is um, or what their, their, um, where they should strive for, what's their safe zone. So for people without heart disease, we say we want to see an LDL less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. And in children with familial hypercholesterolemia, our goal is less than 130 if they haven't had any cardiac disease. Now, even lower is better, but um, those are our goals. For people who've already experienced a heart attack or a stroke, um, the goal would be less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. And then um, very recently in 2022, um, the American College of Cardiology came out with a push um, sort of mirroring what they say in Europe. For people with heart disease and familial hypercholesterolemia or high LP little a and multiple other risk factors, um, it's really good to get the LDL down less than 55 and even lower is better. Next slide. 
Um, so, you know, I've just given you a whirlwind tour of, um, of familial hypercholesterolemia, but we have so many webinars um, in our, um, it, on our website that you can log on to and, and watch. Um, and so um, I encourage you to do that, to learn more, um, you know, starting with uh, Cholesterol Basics with Josh Knowles, um, and we have multiple other ones, Cholesterol 101. Um, next slide. And we do have um, another um, program coming up February 27th um, at 7 p.m. I'm going to be joined by Allison Jameson, who is one of our board members. Um, and we're going to talk about advances in homozygous FH. Next slide. Now we're going to get to um, the fun part, meeting everybody. Um, so um, I've already um, pointed um, everybody out, Jessica, Kevin, Mackenzie. Um, you'll meet Megan in just a second. Um, she uh, doesn't have a... a a headshot, but um, but she's here in person. So I think we'll just go around um, according to how I'm seeing everybody. So maybe we can start with um, Kevin and um, Jess. Hi, I'm Jessica. I um, am from right outside of St. Louis, about 20, 20 minutes or so. And I was, um, I found out I have, have FH because my daughter who is now nine was diagnosed at seven with homozygous FH. Um, and uh, that's kind of where we, we began with this journey. Um, and we're just a little family. We like um, to go boating on the weekends. One of our favorite things to do. And we're busy with sports with our daughter. She's in basketball, volleyball, and soccer. That's great. Kevin. Yep. And I'm, and I'm Kevin and I, uh, I found out all about this as well with, with, with our daughter. So um, like she said, we, we love spending a lot of time together and things like that. And just um, family history wise though, we just, you know, after all this happened, we kind of thought, and, you know, we realized that both of our parents had it um, and things like that. So it kind of just, it kind of opened our eyes even more to what, you know, all the, the reasons behind it. But also, I'd like to say that none of our family was ever diagnosed with FH. It didn't have a name. It was just, you have high cholesterol. Yep. So. Um, thank you very much, Kevin and um, Jess Jessica. Um, Megan, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks, Dr. McGowan. Um, my name is Megan Pearson. I live outside of Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a registered dietitian and a college lecturer. And my journey with FH started when I was four, um, but I didn't actually learn that I was diagnosed with FH until last year when I was 36. So as a young kid, it was discovered that my dad, my brother and myself all had unusually high cholesterol levels, but our doctors just encouraged a healthy diet, which was pretty typical back then when this was first happening. It just wasn't having the impact that anyone expected though. So after several years of that, I started on statins. Um, later, Zetamib was added as well and these helped, but they just weren't quite enough. So as I became an adult and started taking ownership over my own healthcare journey, I started asking my doctors, what else can I do? What else is available to me to optimize my cholesterol levels? Um, my dad had had a heart attack at 35, and as I was approaching that age, I didn't want to end up um, having that same experience. I wanted to learn from what he went through. So uh, I just kept hearing, there's really nothing else that you can do. So last year was when I was finally um, referred to the Piedmont Heart Institute here in Atlanta, and I met Jan McAllister, a lipidemiologist who diagnosed me, uh, started me on another medicine called a PCSK9 inhibitor. And now my LDL is within a normal, a normal zone. It's just above that threshold at 57, which is great, but it took three decades to get there. So um, for me, getting that diagnosis of FH was really key to getting to this safe zone. That's great. And our own Mackenzie Ames. Hi, thank you. Yes, um, my name is Mackenzie Ames. I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. I am the content manager for the Family Heart Foundation. Uh, before that, I was a freelance writer um, in all sorts of industries, but this is definitely my passion and where I'm happy to be now. Um, 
very quickly, my grandfather in 1966 had a heart attack um, on the dance floor. He was 30 years old um, and he passed away and he had several brothers who also died in their 30s of heart disease and uh, heart attacks. So um, my mom's family kind of always knew something like you guys, Jessica and Kevin, something just kind of ran in the family, but we didn't have a name for it. My mom had an emergency quadruple bypass when she was 42 in 2001. And it wasn't until 2012 when I went to have a physical, a routine physical that I had a doctor who finally said familial hypercholesterolemia. And I think about that, it took 50 years. You know, my grandfather passed in 66 and it wasn't until 2012 until I had a name and I could call my mom and say, have you ever heard of this? No one in my family, and it is a very large family, uh, had ever heard of FH. Um, but now that we've heard of it, we do everything we can to fight against it because there are things to do to fight against it. Um, and on a happy note, I am, uh, I have outlived, you know, I'm, way, I'm older than my grandfather was when he died. And uh, I'm on several treatments. I don't have any side effects from anything. I just live a very happy, healthy life with my uh, with my corgi mix, Maggie. She and I like to go on walks and I like to find trivia around town. And I play, I'm a big old nerd who plays a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. So <laughs> that's me. That, that's great. Um, I'm going to um, pick a little bit on you, Kevin, because we met the other night and you told us um, some some different things. Um, you told us that your dad um, had had um, bypass surgery in 2015 and that he, he sadly passed away at around 74. And you always thought that maybe it was the exposure to Agent Orange that caused the problem. So it sounded like you didn't take um, your, your doctor told you you had high cholesterol. And, and, and what did you do with that? He, he, I think he put you, started you on resuvastatin. Correct. He, he started me on that. And uh, I mean, I'm a typical guy, you know, nothing's going to happen to me kind of mentality. And, you know, I, I wasn't um, taking it like I should. And uh, then just came along and became my enforcer. <laughs> and, um, you know, now it's part of my daily routine. And um, so I take my, my medicine daily. Um, I made it a part of my daily routine. It's my morning routine. My medicine sits right next to my car keys. Um, so when I get up and, and leave for the day, I know to take my medicine right before I walk, grab my keys and walk out the door. So, um, and it's, and it's a huge help. Uh, that was, that was probably the biggest change for me is, is getting that down, getting those numbers down. And, and like I said, establishing that routine and of course, having, having her here to help me is a great, great plus. Yeah. You guys are a good team. There's no doubt about that. And did, did the fact of Reese's diagnosis um, make you more serious about it as well? Uh, absolutely. You know, I, you know, I want to be around to, you know, watch her grow. I want to be around when she plays sports, you know, I want to be around if, you know, if she ever decides to get married, I'd be able to walk her down the aisle. Um, you know, those are things that every dad wants to do. So um, it, it definitely was a eye opening change because it wasn't just about me anymore. It was, it was, it was about the family and, you know, me sticking around for that. That's great. Um, Megan, you know, I know um, you were, I have a couple of questions. You um, mentioned that your LDL is excellent now, and that's fantastic. Um, you're right in the right zone because you've not had a cardiovascular event. Um, do you remember what your LDL cholesterol was before you began treatment or what your total cholesterol was before you began treatment? Yes. When I was a kid without medication, um, before I started any medication, my total cholesterol was in the high 400s. I want to say it was around 475. And my, if I remember correctly, my HDL was usually around 100, which would have put my LDL at around 375. So you have a great um, HDL, but that LDL is very high. Yes. And then even with um, statins and azetamibe, the two of those combined, my total cholesterol was still elevated. It was around 265. Um, LDL was still around 165, just about 100 less. And uh, that was with diet, exercise. I was a registered dietitian. I was running half marathons on the weekends. Um, I mean, that was, there was nothing else I could do. Right, right. Except meet Jan McAllister. 
Um, yes. <laughs> do, you, do you want to tell um, our audience, um, I think you shared with me um, about sometimes the way you were made to feel um, in a doctor's office, certainly not with Jan McAllister. Um, she got it. But um, with, uh, you know, you don't have to mention names, but just what, 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 what was it like? Sure. I remember just feeling so frustrated. We grew up in a military family. And so every time we moved, which was every year or two or three, we met new doctors. And my poor mom had to go through the whole spiel again. This isn't our fault. We've been doing heart healthy diet for years. Uh, it runs in the family and just having to re-justify to new doctors constantly and then going to new dietitians and new cardiologists. And um, it just felt like every time we walked in, into a new healthcare professional's office that it was, you know, well, what are you doing wrong? You know, why are you eating this? Why are you eating that? And, and um, this is what you should be doing. And it just constantly felt like it was our fault. Um, and honestly, probably through no fault of the, the healthcare professionals, there just wasn't a lot of information known about FH at the time. Uh, and we certainly didn't know about it either. But there was a lot of guilt involved. There's a lot of um, just frustration at feeling like, I feel like I am doing everything that you're telling me to do and it's not working and you're not believing me. So um, I know that was frustrating for us as kids, but especially for my mom too, who was really the one advocating for my brother and I as we were younger. And, and um, Mackenzie, I think that you might've had a similar situation. And the other question I have for you, um, is uh, what about insurance coverage? Was that challenging? Um, yes, my experiences are very similar to Megan. Um, I also had very high, I think my cholesterol was hovering around 400 when I was a kid untreated at nine years old. Um, and yeah, I think there was a lot of, um, there wasn't a lot of thought put into the way things were framed for us, I think, especially as children, um, you know, you don't understand what's happening, but you know, when your mom is in the pediatrician office crying, you know, it's not good stuff. So the doctor was always very traumatic for me. And then going to the dietitians and having them tell me, you know, I was a picky eater growing up and I didn't, I couldn't help it. And being told that the stuff that I was doing, it was my fault. I mean, that lives with me to this day. I have all sorts of knowledge about FH and my condition. And I still, when, um, when I get a lab result and the LDL is a little high or has gone up any, I question, you know, should I have had that side of fries? And it's, it, it really hurts to, to feel like you're doing it to yourself, even though, you know, you're, you're not doing it to yourself and the insurance company doesn't help the journey. <laughs> um, the, the insurance I've had some some fun times with insurance companies before I started working with the Family Heart Foundation. Like I said, I was a freelancer. So my insurance changed a lot depending on my, my current situation. And I have been through every major insurance company and I've had uh, a lot of issue. Now, luckily, I know my mother had these issues with statins when they first came out. Um, I have been fortunate enough that the statin issue seems to be um, easier to navigate, but the PCSK9 inhibitor is a, a battle to get. And I know that um, in 2018, I was first prescribed it and I was denied over and over. I know there was a big, I was I was uh, featured in a New York Times article about how many people are being denied this medicine. Um, I had doctors tell me I didn't need it because I hadn't had an event yet. Um, I am the textbook case for a PCSK9 inhibitor and I, I can't get my hands on it. Most recently it was, I wrote a, a blog for the foundation on access to cholesterol lowering medicine, outlining my four hours on the phone, my, you know, I lost count of how many emails were going back and forth, you know, up to five to six trips to the pharmacy to try to straighten out the very minutia bureaucratic paperwork stuff that it feels like they put in front of us to, te to test whether or not we're going to keep going. And um, they don't know me, so I do keep going. But these these last ones it was just I finally got it but I had to do like I said you know four hours on the phone and 10 times to the pharmacy and then um the family heart foundation's care navigation center helped me with the last hurdle because it was when I got to a point where I didn't even know who I was supposed to call um because it was a 
it was in a computer program that my doctor didn't control, the pharmacy didn't control, I didn't control, I didn't know who, I, I didn't know. And luckily the care navigator at Family Heart helped me through that. You know, um, no, and I, I think your your story is not um it's not unique. Um, and I would say um to those people you know listening, um it it it, it sometimes feels easier to just give up, and that's what the insurance company wants you to do, um is just give up, um because these meds are somewhat expensive, but but you need them, and so I'm glad you persisted. Um, but I I, I think it's a it's a plug for the care navigation center too because if you're finding it really stressful to get through those hurdles. Um, our care navigation center is, is really wonderful. Um, I wanna move back to Jessica um, because I know you had a lot of challenges getting Reese diagnosed. And just like Mackenzie was persistent with getting a PCSK9 inhibitor, you are like a just a great mother. I mean, you were not gonna take no for an answer and you were gonna find things out. I mean, I know Kat Davis Ahmed, who uh, did the introductions um, from the Family Heart Foundation, played a big role in contacting you and getting you connected with Dr. Ann Goldberg, who is a fantastic um, FH specialist and a real friend to the Family Heart Foundation. But before you met um, Kat and Dr. Goldberg, I, I remember you saying you were pretty frightened. And can you tell us a little bit about how Reese was diagnosed and your journey? Yeah. Yeah, so Reese, um, probably uh, roughly two years before she was diagnosed, she um, developed uh, bumps on her, on both of her knees, um, and I took her to the doctor, and the doctor said they were from, um, it's a virus that kids get called molluscum, and sometimes it can take, you know, a while, six months, sometimes maybe even up to a year for them to go away just something that you kind of just deal with. Um, fast forward to about a year and a half later, they were still there, didn't, and actually I, you know, I thought they were getting bigger. So I, I said to her doctor, you know, I'd really like to, um, you know, go to a dermatologist and see what, you know, we can do about this because she, she started school and, you know, kids are, they want to know what those bumps are on her knee. And so she was getting self-conscious of them. So we went to um, the dermatologist and she did with two different appointments. Uh, she did two different treatments for molluscum um, and neither one of them did anything at all. So um, bring her back there the third time. She said, I'd really like to um, do a biopsy and make sure because it should have, you know, these treatments should have helped at least a little bit. So she did the biopsy. She called me at home on a Saturday and said, do you have high cholesterol in your family? And I said, I do. Um, and she said, okay, well, these are xanthomas and they're caused by, um, you know, having high cholesterol. So you need to get a lipid panel for Reese immediately. <laughs> So I called her pediatrician and uh, went to the hospital and got her uh, blood drawn and it came back and I got it written down here. Her total cholesterol was 853 and uh, her LDL was 776. Um, and her doctor called me, you know, he was at home he, on his day off and told me, listen, I've had kids with high cholesterol, but I've never had a child with cholesterol this high. So he, um, he recommended she see an endocrinologist at the Children's Hospital in St. Louis. And in the meanwhile, you know, I'm talking to my friends, you know, you get to Googling stuff and it's terrifying. Um, I found the FH Foundation. My friend said, you know, find the moms on Facebook. You know, I'm sure there's got to be a chat somewhere, um, you know, something like that. And that's how I found the FH Foundation. And uh the next morning I, I had a message from Kat asking um, if she could call me. And so she calls me and I'm bawling because I th I'm thinking, you know, my kid, you, you go seven years and you think your child is perfectly healthy. And then to find out she has something horrible that you would never think a child, you know, it would never cross my mind that a child would have high cholesterol. And so um, Kat is the one that helped me find Dr. Goldberg. And um, that was, you know, where this kind of all started. 
And now she um, she takes um, rosuvastatin, uh, 20 milligrams, and Zetia, 10 milligrams. And her last blood draw with those two medications, her total cholesterol was 493, and her LDL was 454. Um, but since then, she started Rapatha, the PSK9 inhibitor, and we have yet to get her lab results back. But we're hoping, um, Dr. Goldberg's hoping for about a 50% in her numbers. So hopefully, fingers crossed for that. We, we, we are all crossing our fingers, that, yes. that's for sure. I mean, yeah. I want to be conscious of time here, but, um, you know, because I know I'm seeing um, the webinar chat that there are lots of lots of questions and things that um, people might want to ask, but I want to ask um, you all, does anyone um, want to share a story with us um, about talking to family members about FH? You know, there are lots of emotions um, surrounding FH. I mean, sometimes there's guilt uh, for passing a gene on. Um, you know, nobody's guilty. We can't help our genes. Um, and, you know, I always say to people, you know, your parents probably gave you a lot of other very good genes, um, but um, in each family handles things differently. So um, does anyone want to say a little something? Okay. I'll just say, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Sorry. Go ahead, Megan. Um, I was just going to say, um, I, I remember I mentioned previously, my dad had a heart attack at 35. And then as I started getting older and approaching that same age, just feeling so much stress and anxiety about my own risk for having a cardiac event and um, having a conversation with my dad one day and him just profusely apologizing for this that he had put on me when there was nothing that he could do. This was not his fault. And Mackenzie, I know you have a similar story with that as well. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's so great to have the information and to have the knowledge and the diagnosis of FH. But after a lifetime of dealing with this condition and the ramifications of it, it still um, leads to a lot of emotionally charged conversations with family who uh, either feel guilty about passing it on or family who you're worried about who just have been conditioned our whole lives to say, this is your fault. You need to do the diet and exercise. And so that's still um, ingrained in them. And just, you know, that, that guilt and that worry um, for other family members, knowing that the diet and exercise just isn't going to be enough. Mackenzie, did you want to make a comment and then we'll get back to you Jess too? Yeah. I mean, yeah, Megan and I both, I have it from, you know, I have FH from my mother and um, I find it to be um something she's guilty about, but also something we bond over because I can call her and talk to her about my problems with the insurance company, about medicine I'm taking, or just about the guilt after, you know, if my LDL went up 10 points, you know what I mean? She understands it better than anybody. So I'm, I'm grateful in a way that we have this together. Um, I have noticed in my very large family, I've, in the last couple of years, I've taken note of how the folks in my family without FH handle what, you know, what we go through because, you know, we know what we go through, but I, you know, I have a sister who doesn't have FH and she has had to learn all about it. And she worries in a way that, you know, she can't control anything about it. You know, she worries about my mother. She worries about me. Um, she, it, it is a, it's a, it affects the entire family, not just those of us that have it. And I have always found that in my family, the people who don't have, um, the people who don't have FH are often more interested in finding out all the news about the lipid world. They, I have two cousins who became registered dietitians who don't have FH, but specialize in lipids and fats. And it's just very interesting to me that the ones that don't have it have had more of an interest than the ones that do who would rather just not talk about it. Sure, sure. Thanks for sharing that. And, and Jessica, were you gonna say something? I was just gonna say that, you know, um, with my daughter's diagnosis, I kept my, my niece popped in my head because, you know, she's the, the only other child, you know, in our, in our family. And I wanted to make sure that she was tested and checked. So I ended up calling my brother's ex-wife to, you know, make sure she got my niece tested. And I don't know, you know, a hundred percent that she did or what the outcome was, but, you know, it just dawned on me like, oh my gosh, well she, you know, and her dad, ha his cholesterol is really high and 
I'm pretty sure that he has my brother. I'm pretty sure he mm-hmm. might be homozygous. It's really high and he doesn't respond to medicine well, but he's a stubborn German that, you know, just thinks he's doing, you know, listens to the doctor and thinks he's doing all that he could be doing and, it, and he's not. Well, so. I want to, um, I think you're a good aunt. You're a great aunt. Um, I, I want to um, thank everybody, all of you um, for sharing, you know, sometimes it, it's hard to share your own personal story. And I'm really proud of all of you for being so determined to get the care that you need and to really um, be persistent. You're teaching your physicians, your healthcare providers about FH. Um, there, it's it's unfortunate that there is a there are a lot of um Healthcare providers that are, um, they don't have experience with it. They don't understand it. And um, I think sometimes when you don't understand something, you sort of push it off to um, the, 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 the patient themselves, you know, like, aren't you, you, you accusing you of not eating properly or um, not taking your medicines? Um, so I, I, you know, encourage you to keep educating your friends, your family, um, and your, your healthcare providers. I know Kat is back on the um, back on the scene here. Um, Kat, do we have any questions that we should answer? Are they directed to um, you know Megan or Mackenzie or Jess or Kevin? Hi, everybody. I'll just second Dr. McGowan's thanks for um, for sharing so much of your experience. I know it rings true for many, including myself, who also has uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. We have fantastic questions. Um, a lot of them, I think, are for you know, sort of for Dr. McGowan. But I would be great to hear from you guys about it. And I'll just say to our audience, you, keep you can keep adding your your questions and and comments for the panelists as we go. And I will do my best to um, uh, to to direct them. So we had a couple of questions that were really helpful about the diagnostic criteria for FH. You know, what else besides family history? Is there a specific test? How do you know the difference between H? O and H E. Yeah, you know, it, it, that's an excellent question. So um, there are some clinical diagnostic tools that we use. Um, there's one called the Dutch Lipid Network, Clinic Network, um, that looks at um, family history. It looks for physical findings, like what Jessica was talking about um, with Reese. Um, those were xanthalasmas and we can in, in xanthomas, and we can see xanthalasmas and xanthomas um, in adults um, with um, heterozygous FH and certainly even in children with homozygous FH. And what you're really looking at around the eyes, there can be these little cholesterol deposits. They almost look like um, uh, little plaques. Um, some people get something called corneal arcus, which is a rim of white around the colored part of their eye. And, and that um, is a cholesterol deposit. And then the Achilles tendon, the, the ankle tendons, they can get, um, the, the tendon itself can get replaced with um, cholesterol and that can make the tendon look big, but be very um, unstable. Um, and so um, we look for physical findings, we look for family history, and we look for um, very high lipid values. There are genetic tests. Um, there are several um, specific gene mutations that we can see. Um, and some people will choose to get a, a genetic test. Um, genetic tests are becoming cheaper. Um, and one thing we know is if one person gets a genetic test, um, then the family members can get a less expensive genetic test because the family members only have to be tested for the one gene um, abnormality that the, the, uh, the original person found to have FH has. So those are the ways we, um, we evaluate. And then sometimes um, for um, people who, with heterozygous or um, homozygous FH, particularly homozygous FH children, we would check um, things like a CT angiogram where you're actually looking at the, you do an echocardiogram and a, um, and a CT angiogram where you're actually looking um, for um, blockages in the arteries, but you can do it non-invasively. Okay. Well, that leads right into another bunch of questions that I think are um, are so important. And that is, you know, there's this, things can go either way, right? So what if you have super high LDL and a strong family history, but your genetic test comes back negative? So I have a few together, right? You're, so um, what if you have a positive FH genetic test, but your LDL is not quite as high, 
Um, and then, you know, then the, then somebody else asked, what if I have, you know, high LDL, but the, but the genetic test came back negative. And, um, and then I think related to all of those questions is how do you base the treatment, the LDL lowering treatment? Yeah. So uh, uh, let's just start with, um, you should treat the LDL cholesterol. Um, you should get that down to a safe zone um, for everybody. Um, there are some, so we have um, identified over 2000 different mutations in several genes, the LDL receptor gene, the APOB gene, not important to remember, or the PCSK9 gene. So we've identified many, many mutations um, and we're still identifying some. So um, it, it, it's possible for someone to get a genetic test and it be negative because the gene, the, the, mute, the single mutation in um, a gene has just not been identified. It's also possible for someone to have a genetic mutation um, and have other good genes that are protecting them so that their LDL is not as high as we would expect. Um, in fact, um, we've seen um, a homozygote um, patient um, who um, is in our registry who has two mutations. Um, so truly a homozygote and it, L, an untreated LDL of 318, still very high, but it's not as high as what like Jess, Jess pointed out for Reese. So, um, you know, there are all sorts of different permutations and combinations. Um, there are also things that sometimes people get told you have a VUS, which is a variant of unknown significance. And those can sometimes turn into being thought to be um, pathogenic variants, meaning they cause um, FH. So the most important thing is to treat the LDL. Um, but the uh, one thing I would argue is if someone has a genetic mutation in their LDL, say they're an adult and they have a genetic mutation and their LDL is only, uh, you know, 170, um, that person still needs to be treated very aggressively because the point for that person is they've had that level since birth. Um, so it's different than, um, you know, eating your way to 170. Um, so I, I, I think that that is the key. Um, so we just, it, it's still important to know if someone is, it has a genetic mutation, even if their LDL is not quite as high as um, some other people's. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. It totally does. I, 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 I don't know, because we have such great panelists, if you very quickly want to comment on the whole question of genetic testing or um, anybody have thoughts on that? Because we have some great questions to follow up on too. No? Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure the panel had a chance. Um, so so doc, Dr. McGowan, that leads right into the next set of questions that are, you know, how do you decide on um, what treatment, how low the LDL should be? What is your safe zone, we, you know, I know you covered that briefly in your talk, but maybe we go back to that. And then is there an LDL that's too low? Okay, so let's start with, is there an LDL that's too low? And um, importantly, we have people that have genetic mutations that cause very low LDL. Those are lucky people. Um, so there's some people with a loss of function mutation for PCSK9, and there's some ApoB mutations that can lead to LDL levels throughout a person's entire life that are in the single digits. And those people live and um, you know can reproduce and be healthy. So there's really no LDL that's too low. Is there an LDL where you know maybe it, you, you don't need to keep going any lower and that that that, that is true but um what i would say you know it, and cats um asked uh, just to reiterate the safe zones so if somebody doesn't have a history of cardiac disease try to get your ldl less than 100 milligrams per deciliter for children at least less than 130 but lower is better if someone has a history of cardiac disease but not many other risk factors they don't have hypertension diabetes etc then getting the LDL less than 70, um, but lower is better. Um, and an LDL less than 55 in people with multiple risk factors um, and FH is, is I think really what we're really striving for. Um, and so it's important for people to know um, that, and when I meet people with FH, when I see them in clinic, 
I, I like to set us up for success um, by saying to people that it's, it's not likely we're going to get your LDL to goal with just one or two medicines. You may require three and even four medicines. And if we say that from the beginning, then somebody doesn't feel like a failure when I start them on high dose statins and their LDL is still 200. Um, we can say we expected that. We want to, we're going to keep adding. Um, so I think pushing to get to your, your safe zone is really important. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I don't really think there's an LDL that's too low. Thank you. When, and I, I, you know, I think hearing the stories of all of you talk about how you kept going to keep getting your LDL um, where it was, even when you faced barriers along the way, whether that was a healthcare provider that maybe wasn't aware as aware of FH or wasn't as aggressive in treating or a health or a insurance um, challenge. I think that's really inspiring and what we hoped to, to share with people. So I have uh, two other sets of questions and we, we probably have about two minutes to address them. So one is um, two related questions. And that is that, um, um, the question about what is the role of, of LP little a, how does that change your thinking? And then um, if I might say a lot of people think about, sometimes they get their LPA checked when they get their particle sizes checked. How do you think about particle size when the LDL is super high or when the LDL is under control? How much attention should people pay to that? But So LPA and particle size. Yeah, so lipoprotein little a, we're having a, um, a, a discussion um, on Wednesday, um, but lipoprotein little a is a very important risk factor. Um, it is a lipoprotein that looks very similar to LDL, but it has some added um, uh, effects. It has this other um, apoprotein called apolipoprotein A, and that combination um, just in shorthand can increase the risk for plaque formation it can increase the risk for clotting um, and it can increase the risk for aortic valve disease. Um, so it's a very important risk factor and it often coincides with FH. We're learning more, you know, we used to say 50% um, of people with FH have high LP little a, we now say 30 to 50%, but it's certainly um, likely that it is higher than what we see in the general population. About one in five people has an elevated LP little a. So it's a very common um, disorder. Um, so LP little a, I think if, if somebody has um, very elevated LDL and they have an elevated LP little a, I'm gonna push to get their LDL down as low as humanly possible. We, um, we have lipoprotein apheresis that we can use to treat LP little a, elevated LP little a, but um, the other agents that hopefully will be, turn out to be safe and effective at reducing cardiovascular risk um, that can lower LP little a are in clinical trials. So we're, we're waiting till hopefully 2026, we'll have an agent for LP little a. LDL particle number. Um, so, if somebody has more LDL particles, they have more small dense LDL, um, that can be important. But in the situation of FH, um, it is not part of, I, I, I never meant measure particle number in somebody with FH. It's, I, I, I measure LDL and I get it down as low as humanly possible. Um, LDL particle number, a lot of people will say, but I, you know, I have a, uh, if my particle number is, is not problematic. Um, so people who have uh, um, a lot of LDL, it doesn't matter if their particle number is, is not super elevated. It's it, people who have oh, FH are in, it, 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 at risk no matter what. Thank so you. They, yeah. Very helpful. Um, so a couple of other questions came in. Um, that, so that that I can't resist asking, so I'll just squeeze them in. The question is, you know, where do you start with, and, and I wanna refer people to our webinars also where we go more into depth, but where do you, where do you start? And I, you know, spoiler alert, you start with statins. And then would you, would you expect if you have FH to be on medication for life or do you stop and, and your LDL stays down? Yeah, so, um... That's a really important question. Um, it, your uh, LDL only stays 
um, down when you're on your medicines. It's not like an antibiotic that you can take it and stop taking it. You have to stick with it. And there is data to show that the longer your LDL is lower, the better for you. Um, so um, you don't want to, and we do know far too um, commonly people stop taking their medications. So, and we start with statins, we add azetamide, and then we would add a PCSK9 inhibitor. And I will tell you, PCSK9 inhibitors work better um, when somebody's on azetamide or somebody's on a statin. We see a, a really powerful reduction. So it's it's that sequence. Um, it's sort of required by insurance, um, but it's also possible for some people with FH to get to the goal um, with just two drugs. And then they don't have to do the PCSK9 inhibitor. But in general, it's uh, high dose statins, ezetimibe, and then um, a PCSK9 inhibitor. And there are other agents. There's, you know, bempedoic acid and, and other agents that we can add on. We might as well, you might as well say them all since we, so there's an inclisiran is another. Yep, and inclisiran is a new PCSK9 inhibitor. It works by a different mechanism than um, evolocumab or alirocumab, um, but it's, it, it, and it's a powerful agent because people take one dose, they take another dose at three months, and then every six months thereafter. Um, I referred already to lomidopide and even uncumab, which can both, in people with homozygous FH, um, lower LDL by as much as 50%, um, which is really, really encouraging. And they're looking at getting um, uh, uh, approval um, for children as young as five. Um, and so those studies are ongoing. Um, so, yep, and bempedoic acid is an agent approved for FH and for um, um, for people with a, a atherosclerotic vascular disease. Great, I think we've mentioned it all. I think um, we're going to have to go to the to the close, and Megan, I'll pull up the um, the slides. But I, I think we have in the the set of questions that I didn't get to ask. I think we have our topic for a, an upcoming webinar, and that is how do you educate your healthcare professionals, and how do you get them on board um, with you, or how do you? Um, and the answer to how do you? What do you do if you don't have a healthcare provider who's tuned in? And that is to contact the Family Heart Foundation Care Navigation Center and ask us, and we'll point you in the direction of a of a specialist who can help, and that can be um, incredibly important. And that's on our on our website website. So I see a lot of really, you know, just thank you everybody for joining. It's been wonderful to see you here. We invite you if you have FH or you have high LP little a to visit familyheart.org backslash advocates for awareness and uh, and join us as a volunteer. That Megan, Jessica, uh, I hope Kevin now, and, uh, and of course, Mackenzie are all volunteers. I started as a volunteer at the Family Heart Foundation. It's important to be part of that community and we need your voices. Um, if you go back, please, one slide, Megan. Um, we wanna say thanks to everybody for your support to the Family Heart Foundation. You help make webinars like this possible. Um, you can donate any day to the Family Heart Foundation. Uh, we are a nonprofit 501c3 and we depend on your donations to keep doing our, our work. Um, and then finally, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. McGowan. Thank you, Jessica and Kevin and Megan and Mackenzie for sharing a bit of yourselves. And, um, and thanks for every, everybody for joining us. We really appreciate it. Have a wonderful Okay. Thanks so much, everyone.